interested in the quality of life. Part of that, of course, is the level of income. Uh, can people feed themselves? Uh, can they afford uh, health care? Can they afford basic amenities? But we know that uh, uh, there's uh, more to life uh, than bread alone. Uh, we know that uh, material possessions uh, aren't everything. We know that simple measures like the income per person only give us a rough reflection of the overall level of well-being of an individual or a nation. And since in sustainable development, what we're really interested in is not raising market income per se. We're really interested in raising human well-being. It's important for us to ask then, how can we measure well-being? I've used so far the shorthand of the gross domestic product per person because it's not a terrible indicator. It gives us uh, some uh, relevant information. Uh, it is not only related to income uh, and not only related to the absence of poverty when that income per person is high enough, but it also is related to other things that we know we care about, education levels, health, uh, and uh, opportunities in life. But of course, we can do better than using one simple indicator of human well-being. And we know that whatever indicator we use, we can't just rely on averages. We have to look at the variation within a society or across societies as well as the average numbers that we're using. So what are some of the options of measuring human well-being that go beyond the simple calculation of the gross domestic product? Per person. One important innovation <clears throat> championed by the United Nations Development Program during the last quarter century is the Human Development Index. It tries to give a more holistic account of human development to take into account things which empower people, which uh, help them meet uh, their capacities. Uh, and it does that by looking at income per person as just one of the three basic dimensions uh, of well-being, adding in indicators of educational attainment, whether it's literacy or enrollment rates, together with measures of health, uh, typically looking at life expectancy at birth. And by taking a kind of weighted average uh, a part due to income, a part due to education, and a part due to health. The United Nations Development Program has created and now tracked for uh, a quarter century an overall index of human development, or HDI. And we've learned a lot from that. If you look at the HDI, or the Human Development Index, uh, you can see that it looks similar to uh, the map of gross domestic product per person, but it's by no means the same. Uh, there are countries that are relatively uh, low on income per capita and do quite well on the Human Development Index because they have good uh, indications uh, of life expectancy and uh, educational attainment. There are, on the other hand, many countries that rank very high in income per capita, uh, but do not have good outcomes when it comes to health and education. Uh, let's take a look at uh, some examples of countries that are rather rich in terms of their gross domestic product per capita, uh, but rather uh, poor on their human development uh, indicators. Equatorial Guinea uh, is such a case. Equatorial Guinea was a completely impoverished uh, country in West Africa until a few years ago when it struck it rich uh, with the uh, oil and gas discoveries. That's potentially good if those oil and gas earnings are used wisely and invested in raising overall well-being. But there's a lag and there's a, a question of uh, the quality uh, of governance to accomplish that. As it stands today, 
Equatorial Guinea ranks rather high on income per person. Uh, it's uh, 32nd in the world in income per person, but it ranks 136th in the Human Development Index, meaning that its education and health outcomes are still pretty miserable. It has not yet turned its oil and gas earnings into real benefit broadly for the society. Another example is similar, uh, Angola. Uh, Angola is a country in southwest Africa, also a major hydrocarbons economy, uh, also with the opportunity to take those earnings of oil and gas and convert them into broad-based improvements of living conditions. But there has been a serious gap uh, and uh, a lot of corruption along the way. So that Angola ranks in the middle of the pack, 88th in the gross domestic product per capita, but 148th in the Human Development Index. So you see that the Human Development Index adds a lot of useful information for us by giving us a broader-based snapshot than taking the gross domestic product per person alone. If you flip it around and ask about countries that are uh, ranking higher on their human development than on their income per capita, the reverse of the uh, phenomenon uh, that we just saw in Equatorial Guinea and Angola, uh, you could look to a country uh, like Sri Lanka, uh, which traditionally, uh, even though it's had a, a lot of violence and upheaval, has had relatively high social indicators of health and education, even at a relatively low level of domestic product per person. Uh, another country quite uh, developed uh, at this point, a high uh, level of gross domestic product per person, but even a higher human development uh, outcome is South Korea. South Korea is an amazing country. It's had a huge success in economic growth, meaning that the GDP per person has soared over uh, the last half century. It's become one of the uh, richest countries in the world. But part of that has been an incredible focus on raising education standards, and on the health of the population. So that as high as uh, South Korea now ranks uh, in uh, the GDP per capita, roughly around uh, 30th uh, in the world, uh, its ranking in human development is uh, near the top of the world's charts, uh, roughly uh, around the 12th position in HDI. So this has uh, been a quite useful expansion of our uh, ability to assess and categorize countries because just as the World Bank categorizes countries as high income, middle income, and low income, uh, the United Nations has categorized countries as uh, high human development, medium hu human development, and uh, low uh, levels of human development. But there's another absolutely fascinating way that we can uh, attempt to assess well-being. And you think about it for a moment, you say, hey, why not? Uh, and that is ask people. Ask people about the quality of their lives. Are they satisfied with their lives? Uh, how would they rate their lives uh, in terms of uh, uh, a ladder uh, where the top rung of that ladder would be full satisfaction, the bottom rung of the ladder is uh, feeling pretty glum, uh, and asking people where they stand on that ladder of life, uh, say between the lowest rung at zero and the highest rung at 10. In recent years, there has been a huge, absolutely fascinating effort to assess well-being in that straightforward way, asking people, are you happy in essence? And it's important to note uh, that psychologists and, and uh, scholars of happiness have found two quite distinct dimensions of happiness and two quite different kinds of questions to uh, elicit that. One is to ask emotionally, did you have a good day yesterday? Were you happy? Uh, positive emotions. Uh, and that's uh, sometimes called emotional or affective happiness. And the other is to ask people a quite different kind of question. How do you evaluate your life? Are you satisfied with your life? Where would you 
put yourself on the ladder of life. That's called evaluative happiness. You're evaluating life. And that's uh, the kind that I think we should look at uh, to try to understand uh, where countries and individuals uh, feel they are in the path of broader economic development. We have a map. Uh, we can look uh, at the uh, distribution of reported happiness in that evaluative sense, in the sense of life satisfaction around the world. Uh, one thing you do notice, richer countries tend to be happier, but that's not all there is to happiness. Uh, there are countries that are middle-income countries, close to the top of the charts. Uh, there are uh, richer countries uh, at the top of the league in GDP per capita, uh, but not so happy. Uh, and uh, we learn a lot from this. Uh, looking at this, I'm happy to say that the Americas, uh, that's my part of the world, <laughs> that's a pretty happy part of the world. Uh, you can see it uh, in, in the maps. Uh, Western Europe, uh, Australia, New Zealand uh, rank very high on happiness. Uh, some of the poor regions, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, rank uh, much lower. What do we learn when we study uh, the differences of happiness in this evaluation sense around the world? We find out that income per person or GDP per capita matters, but it doesn't matter all that much. Uh, we have to keep focus that it's just one aspect of happiness. A second major reason for happiness or unhappiness is the quality of what we call social capital, uh, social connections. Do people have uh, good networks of friends uh, and colleagues? Do they trust others in their community? Do they trust their government to be honest or is their government corrupt? That's a huge determinant of whether people report their lives to be of high satisfaction or not. Their own health, physical health and mental health, of course, plays a very important role. And what I find absolutely fascinating and important, uh, a theme that I want us to reflect on as we think about sustainable development, is that an individual's values, things that an individual holds to be important, are shown to be strongly related to whether that individual is happy or not. Interestingly, the people who report uh, a very strong fixation on getting rich, on very materialistic values, turn out to be a bit more frustrated. They don't report as much satisfaction in life. People who report that generosity is very important to them, volunteering, giving, a sense of altruism, contributing to the community, are also values that are shown repeatedly in many studies to be related to a higher level of life satisfaction. This is quite important for us as we think about sustainable development. If we simply pursue income per capita, just raise that gross domestic product per capita no matter what, we're going to lose it on many counts. Societies will become highly unequal. The physical environment will come under great threat. But also people will not necessarily achieve the kind of happiness and life satisfaction that they want. If we take a more balanced and holistic approach as sustainable development bids us to do, paying attention to higher income per person, but also focusing on healthy societies, social inclusion, honest government, networks of social support, and if we promote values of generosity, of compassion, of voluntarism, uh, rather than values of st strong materialism, of just trying to get rich, that also can help people to become happy. In the end, our goal is satisfaction with life. Uh, it is human well-being. We need to take a rich and varied perspective. Fortunately, we have more and more tools to be able to measure, assess, uh, and ultimately to help to promote improvements of human well-being uh, in this uh, deeper and more inclusive sense.